All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. It's 1130. So before we get really started, we're going to give people about two minutes to keep logging in. Um, I'm Nina Johnson, and I'm here for the Lowe Museum this morning to give you guys a little talk about Rochelle Feinstein and her exhibition Fredonia, which is currently up at the gallery. Um, you can see sort of a, hopefully you're seeing an image from that show right now on your screen. And we're gonna kind of virtually walk through this exhibition for about 30, 45 minutes, and then, um, We'll leave about 15 minutes at the end for questions. Please don't be shy. I've never had a group from the low be shy, so I hope this, this does not break that trend, even though you're all on your computers. Um, and if you prefer to send questions in the chat and you know how to do that, you're certainly welcome to, and I'm happy to answer them that way as well. I know everyone doesn't like to turn their camera on all the time, so. All right, so it is 11.32, we're gonna get started. Um, I am Nina Johnson, and I'm the owner of Nina Johnson Gallery, which is located in Little Haiti. We opened in the fall of 2007 as Gallery Diet in what is now the Wynwood Arts District, and what was then a very desolate industrial Wynwood. Um, we moved to the location that we're in currently about six years ago, and our new location has um, three different exhibition spaces divided across four buildings. We tend to show a intergenerational mix of artists from around the world, from quite emerging to very established. We've now also been working with some estates um, to bring some historic uh, bodies of work into Miami. We are a commercial gallery, and so we do, or I guess I should say, hopefully sell the works that we have on view. Um, and we do anywhere from 12 to 15 exhibitions a year. Um, this year has been unlike any other in that we've been even more digital than we've become in the past couple of years. We're very fortunate that we've been able to continue our programming. We have not missed any of our scheduled exhibitions. Uh, and we've really seen an extraordinary output of work coming from the artists that we work with. And I think the show that we're gonna go through today is a wonderful example of that. Um, I have to say that I'm a little remiss to not have you here in person. Normally when we do these type of exhibition tours, you guys would be here in the flesh and we would be chatting back and forth. So if we are before the Q&A period and somebody just is like bursting with a comment or a question, feel free to jump in and I'm happy to have you participate in the dialogue. So today we're gonna to be looking at the work of Rochelle Feinstein. This is Rochelle's second exhibition with the gallery. Um, Rochelle does have work in one institution here locally, the Perez Art Museum owns her work. Um, she is an artist in her 70s. She was born in 1947 um, in New York and she is still currently based in the city. Rochelle is somebody that I consider um, a sort of creative godmother to a lot of the art, younger artists that we show in our program. She is the chair emeritus for Yale's prestigious painting MFA program. She's been among many other prizes, but most recently a recipient of the American Academy's Rome Prize, which is a fantastic program where they um, allow a group of artists to come and live and work together at the American Academy in Rome. Um, it's usually interdisciplinary, so 
Um, I know an artist who happened to be there with Alice Waters. And so every evening, you know, Alice was cooking dinner for them. Um, and Rochelle really had an, a wonderful experience there. It led to a series of museum exhibitions and what was a major retrospective that traveled to about eight different institutions in Europe and landed, um, its last venue was the Bronx Museum in New York and that was in 2018. So, you know, this year, um, as, as many of you know, has been wild to say the least, um, wild and unexpected. And in March, you know, we had a completely different exhibition scheduled at the gallery to happen this time of year. And in March, we were really looking at what are we as a gallery doing to help our audiences process the current moment that we're living in? So I had been fortunate um, to have been in constant conversation with a lot of the artists that we show and learning how they were processing this year of grief and trauma and in some ways excitement. Um, and so we knew that the other two exhibitions that were hap that are up at the gallery were happening. And those two exhibitions, one is a young artist who's originally from Miami and is now based in Oakland. His name is Woody Diathello. Um, he's the son of Haitian immigrants, and he definitely brought a lot of youth and energy to this kind of triptych of shows. Um, the other artist is Natalie Provosti, who's a very meditative artist. She has an intense practice where she uh, studies color, um, and she is a woman in her early 40s. And I just you know, Rochelle popped into my mind as somebody who is funny and witty and experienced and, you know, forgive my language, but really ballsy and just like exactly the person that I knew I wanted to have, have a voice in this moment. So I reached out to Rochelle and I said, you know, it's been a while since we did a show but here we are, and I'm wondering what you're working on this year. Are you working, um, or have you been kind of like hiding away at home or upstate somewhere? And she said, I'm working like crazy, and I'm so excited that you called, because I have a body of work that I'm, I'm currently processing and getting through, and I would love a goalpost to work towards, and she really wanted to have this body of work up in the aftermath of whatever the November election turned out to be. That was very important to her. So I'll give you a little bit of general background about Rochelle before we start specifically going through the images of the show. Um, Rochelle is somebody who is a masterful painter but she's highly self-critical of what that means. So as somebody that came of age in the time of the kind of bombastic male, mostly white 80s painters, Rochelle was always kind of like throwing a monkey wrench in there for herself and saying, well, who cares about painting, right? Like, so what that I can do this? So what that anybody can do this? Is this valuable in society? Um, she's done work that, you know, she has a body of work, which are these massive word bubbles. And one of them is in the permanent collection of the Whitney. And it was a whole series of paintings based on the phrase, I love your work. Um, and so she really, you know, it was like, what does that mean? You know, after being an artist for 50 plus years, people come up to you at openings and they're like, I love your work, you know, and it's not that it's a bad thing, but just kind of like questioning that. Um, and so, you know, with this body of work, she had had these two great experiences of one having what was her first major traveling retrospective of her body of work. Two, being in Rome for a year, which we always say Rochelle's work is very well received in Europe, um, where she's a sort of like renegade hero. 
And I think that's because Europeans love to self question. You know, they love this kind of like intense, um, intense, you know, criticality and cynicism. And I think Rochelle has a lot of that. Uh, and so basically she had come out of this period and then, you know, ended up back in New York and somehow was like, trapped in her apartment, trapped in her studio, felt her life was being threatened every time she walked down the sidewalk, every time she got in the elevator to go, you know, work in her own space. Um, and on top of that, she felt the kind of egregious nature of the current, you know, or what it will hopefully be referred to as the past political moment, right? So she just felt like, what is this crazy world that we're living in? Um, and she was thinking about the, the film Duck Soup, which I don't know if you all know this movie, but it's a kind of send up of um, dictatorships. And this little man with a mustache comes to power. And the idea is that he's going to overthrow the government and he's going to create Fredonia. And Fredonia will be so wonderful for all these reasons. And he's sort of putting up the banners of his own face. And um, there's a great clip where he kind of like dances around and he's telling people, you know, oh, you think your taxes are bad now? Wait till I get in power. Fredonia, it's so wonderful. Um, I highly recommend it if you haven't seen it. It's a classic. So Fredonia is the title of Rochelle's exhibition, and you'll have to forgive me because I just noticed the typo in our, our presentation here. That's supposed to have two E's, not one. <laughs> but um, so, drawn and quartered. This is the earliest painting in this body of work. It really almost belongs to an earlier body of work. Rochelle is always looking at the grid. And a lot of people have said to me, this painting is so bodily. Like it feels somehow like body parts. Um, can you all see this large on your screen? I don't know, maybe someone from the museum can unmute themselves and tell me if it's like a, an appropriate scale. It could be larger. Okay, so let's see. We can fix it. It could thing. still be large. Okay. Much better. So, um, so you'll see that there's seven ostensibly primary colors, right? So these are the seven colors of the rainbow. If anyone remembers Roy G. Bid, right? So red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Um, drawing, you know, to be drawn and quartered was a practice that was um, done in England to perpetrators of high treason. And I'll leave the gory details up to you all to look up and see if you want to get into. But Rochelle has always, you know, I was talking about this kind of self-cynicism. To me, this is really a painting about dissecting painting. You know, she's always questioning the grid. The grid is a motif that appears frequently in her work. Um, and I think really what she's doing here is ostensibly drawing and quartering the picture, drawing and quartering the painting. And you can see these kind of um, blobs, I don't know how else to call them, in the four quadrants of the painting. They're really densely layered and textured. Like when you see this painting in person, these things are almost three-dimensional. Um, and then you'll see when we start to go through the other pictures, why these seven colors are important to her, or became important to her. So this was 2019. Um, she started to think about data mapping. So this gives you a sense of the materials, right? It's, whoop, whoop, whoop. Sorry, I just have to do this to get back to the image. So I'm gonna move around a little bit because I want you guys to see these in order in which they were made. So this one. They're small again. Yeah, I'll zoom in once I get them. Um, I'll zoom in and then you guys can see them a little better. So these are quite large, these paintings. Um, 
Sorry, this thing has a mind of its own. What's happening here? This is what happens when you zoom in. It doesn't want to play. It doesn't want to play nicely. Um, so there you go. So these paintings are really large. You know, they're, they're about five feet by five feet square and they have slight variations. Some are off from one another from about an inch, but you see those seven colors. So basically by the time we got to the beginning of 2020, Rochelle was realizing that these seven colors of the rainbow that had become really interesting to her just on a formal level as a painter, as like a fundamental way to revisit color, were being translated in all kinds of data mapping that was being used to describe ourselves to ourselves. So whether you look at like a medical scan, you know, you could see a topography of the eye or a topography of the brain, or you look at a COVID graph, or you look at a political map, or you look at, you know, a, a mapping of populations, this is exactly what you see. Um, which is these seven colors. These are the seven colors that get used. So she started to explore this palette. And you can see in this first painting, there's kind of a delicacy, right? Like this is not an attack on the surface of the canvas, the way drawn and quartered was. This is a much more, I think of this painting as like a cloud of smoke. You know, it almost, it's like it drifts onto the surface of the canvas and could just as easily continue to blow away. So then, uh, ah, sorry guys, I gotta zoom out again and then zoom in because it's gonna keep doing the same. There we go. So now we come here and this painting is so thick and it has that same body that you saw in Drawn and Quartered, right? Like the intensity and the richness of the surface. But you also see the grid. You see how this kind of becomes a grid here, like the vertical lines and the horizontal lines crossing over each other. But also really just like masterful painting, a lot of texture, a lot of dense layering on the surface, a lot of kind of expressionistic tendencies. Um, and it's like, for a lot of painters, this would be their whole body of work would be exploring this. But for Rochelle, she's questioning this, right? Like we know she can do this, she knows she can do this, but where else can she take it? And how else can she refer it, refer back to it? This is the final, I'm gonna kind of jump, jump ahead a little bit. There's one that, okay. So now this one, Per that thinking, she starts to actually poke holes in the canvas. So you have to remember that as this body of work is developing, this year is developing, this particular painting is made with enamel. It's made by pouring sign enamel onto the surface. And then the lines that you see here are actually, it's yarn wool yarn that's been sewn into the surface of the canvas. So she's actually like breaking her own skill, breaking through in this very like messed up Fontana kind of way, right? It's like you take Fontana, but you're doing it with rainbow yarn because how absurd is this? How kind of self-indulgent is this? Um, and then I'm kind of skipping around because at a certain point, what starts to happen is she starts working on multiple of these works at once. This one happens to be one of my favorites in the show. And it reminds me, what I love so much about this painting is that it reminds me of so many great textile works. You know, I think you can literally see the weaving of the color. And I think if you think of it in relationship to the first painting that we looked at and that the kind of um, delicacy of the gesture, the way it's almost like a watercolor on the surface, 
This one is the total opposite. I mean, it's like fully dense, layered painting, several coats of image on top of image, and it's endless. I mean, you stand in front of this painting and you can literally see it receding and coming forward, receding and coming forward. Um, there's been a lot of interest lately in, you know, the Guise Bend quilt makers, uh, a return to kind of thinking about who have we forgotten when we look at art history. And I think craft has been a major gap. Um, and I think there's definitely an homage, a nod to that here. But I also see a lot of the great women painters in this work. You know, I think you could see some Lee Krasner when you look at this painting. Um, you see a lot, a lot of gesture here. So the other body of work that happens in the show in the show are the plein air paintings. And we were talking a little bit more intensely about her time in Rome. So when she was working in Rome, she would order these drop cloths from Amazon and they would come shipped to her in a little cardboard box all folded up. And that's what you see with these. It's a series that she's been exploring for several years now where she takes the job cloth and she's spraying the paint. Um, it's an almost Pollock-like gesture, right? Where it's, it's more about letting the paint itself dictate the content. This is um, acrylic and water on the surface of the job cloth. And then it's, it's literally stretched on the wall. So when it gets hung, it gets like, the tension comes from hanging the piece and with the relationship that the piece has to the wall. This one that we're looking at now is the final one that was made. Um, and I just wanna zoom in so that you guys can see this sort of, the detail that's in these with the way the paint mixes and the way the creases become more prevalent. Um, and what happened with this series is that they became literal depictions of the election maps. So this is the earliest. This is as the night's gone on. And then this was the last one, which I think is a very hopeful, is a very hopeful, much more blended and multicolored future that kind of speaks to the fallacy of, you know, just having a blue and red or black and white description. And then this piece, which was the very last work that was made for the show, um, it's called Fridonia, you know, which again is the title, the title of the show. And it, it becomes almost like a map for the other pieces that are included. You have the seven colors of the rainbow in the background quite literally done as a rainbow. And then one of the earlier plein air paintings cut up and then re-sewn together. And what I'm gonna try, if technology allows, to zoom really in on is I want you guys to see that the thread is actually done in rainbow colors. So it's a little grainy at this size but you can kind of see, see how this is green and pink and purple. Um, and it's this quite more naive relationship to the stitching, you know, very crude. See here, you can kind of see it a little more pronounced. And unlike poking holes, you know, the literal poking holes in the canvas that we saw in that earlier work, it's more, um, like a blanketing, right? It's a little bit of a more tender gesture of wanting to mend, uh, wanting to piece these things together and create a more cohesive whole out of the parts. I'm gonna uh, click through this a little more so that you guys can have kind of a more um, macro view of the show. and kind of revisit these now that I've talked a bunch about them.
And I actually want to um, open up our website very briefly uh, and show you guys something on there so that you can get a quick overview of the other two shows that are up. Um, and hold on one sec. We can meeting, start share, and I guess this, there we go. Google Chrome, share. Can you all see the gallery webpage now? Yes. yes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I wanted you to see some of the installation views of Rochelle's show so that you could get a sense of the scale. So these are so, the plain airs are so large, they're about 11 feet. Um, and I just love this trio. I, I really wanted you all to see the way these paintings relate to one another. So you can really get a sense of them. This installation was so important to her to have these two side by side so that you could kind of see the movement, you know, really feel the, the kind of turning from one direction to the other. And again, there's a very similar thing happening here with this quite like graphic red in partnership with the drawn and quartered, which is that much more bodily painting. And here you can read about very quickly about her, you know, her museum collection. She's in the MoMA, New York, the Amore Pacific Museum in Seoul, the Stadlich in Munich, the PAM and Mount Holyoke College. Um, and these are some of the other uh, awards that she's received. And then very briefly, I'll just show you all the other two exhibitions that are on view. Um, this is Woody Diothello, who's the young Oakland-based artist that I mentioned, working predominantly in ceramic, um, but also in painting, dealing with issues of identity and a sort of self-portraiture through the history of the vessel. Um, this is in our downstairs gallery, which is a converted uh, Art Deco home. Um, and there are two separate spaces. This is one of my favorites. It's called Support for Growth. Balancing Act. And the Wishing Well. This is what the inside of the wishing well looks like. Sort of distorted sense of time. And this painting is titled Private Moment. Um, and then last but not least, in the upstairs gallery, which tends to be more intimately scaled, these are Nathalie's paintings, which are these tiny little meditations on color, um, and her relationship really to feeling as expressed through color and the intensity of it. You can get a sense of the scale here. And we are now open. So we are adhering to all safety protocols. We require all visitors to wear masks at all times. Um, and we, because we have the three galleries, we can make sure there's never more than two or three people in any given space. Um, and we are open Tuesday through Saturday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, so now we can open up to questions if anyone has any. Um, I believe there's a way to put it in the chat, though I don't see a chat here, but you can also just unmute yourselves and I'm happy to answer anything you might wanna know. Let's see. 
Everyone's so shy, always so shy on the Zoom. <laughs> Do we have no questions? Also, if somebody wants to see something, you know, look at one of the images again or whatnot, I'm happy to show you those as well. Okay. All right. No questions, guys. All right. Well, I think if we don't have any questions, we can let you all get on with your day. Um, if you do want to come visit the gallery, like I said, we're open Tuesday through Saturday, 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, all our address information is on our website. It's just ninajohnson.com. And if any of you are on social media, we try to be quite active on our Instagram. It's just at Nina Johnson Gallery, and you'll get a good sense of what shows we have upcoming. And if you would like any additional information specifically on the three shows that we've looked at today, just feel free to let um, Karina or your museum contact know. Karina is our sales director. Her email is Karina with a K at NinaJohnson.com. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. All Thank right, you all. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful rest of your week, and hopefully we'll see you in the gallery soon. Thank you so much. A oh, beautiful job. Congratulations. Lovely. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know why people don't have the chat feature, but I think people are more comfortable typing in. <laughs> it's a really <laughs> interesting phenomenon. I don't know. I'm wondering. I don't know. I don't know why it's not there. We normally see it see it there, but I don't see it here, which is always It must have been in the settings. That you must have disabled it, maybe. Darn. I know. We just don't want Don't be shy, everyone. I know you can ask whatever you want <laughs> to <laughs> ask. I want to force you all to talk. But it's okay. I know it's a lot to take in and we're available, you know, if anyone comes by, we're always happy to answer questions that you might have when you're in the space or by email or whatever. We're here. Thank you again. All right. Take care, everyone.